Good morning. My name is John. I get to serve as the lead pastor of the Center Church, and this is... I'm Brad from New Life Church in Wayland. We represent the south side of the Zero Collective. I don't That's know right. how you'd make an S with your hands, but... We're not sure either. We're going to work on we'll that. We'll figure that out later. We'll figure it out. So as we begin our teaching today in a new format for both of us, uh, I want to begin by asking you guys a question. And I think all of us have had an experience like this, where we've walked into a restaurant like McDonald's or Taco Bell or something like that, and we look at the menu boards and we see this beautiful food. I mean, it just looks incredible. The burgers look juicy. The tacos are overflowing with toppings. And so we order the Big Mac and we wanna eat this burger. We're gonna enjoy it. And then they deliver it to us. And uh, it looks mm. not quite like the picture. It looks a lot more like this. How many of you guys have ever had an experience like that where the burger the advertisement, it looks really good on the outside, but then when you actually get it, it looks less than appealing, less than appetizing. I think we've all had that experience before because that is literally what it's like to eat in this country. Uh, but what you may not know and what might be new to you is that those burgers in the advertisements, they do a lot of things to them, frankly, pretty disgusting things to make them look as delicious as they do. So. John and I did a little bit of internet research, which is always a good idea. It can never steer you wrong. Uh, just to share a few of the things that they do in these advertisements to make these burgers look more appetizing. So the first thing that I read that I heard they do is to give it that steamy kind of hot look, they'll put little pieces of dry ice behind the burger so that the steam rises and trick your eye into <laughs> mm, thinking it's hot. Yeah. An experiment. There I you like go. that. Uh, I don't know if you knew this one, but they paint motor oil onto the burger Ooh. and sometimes eyeliner to enhance grill marks, so. Yummy. That's just so appetizing. I can't think of a better way to eat a Big Mac. <laughs> what about this one? You know how like in pictures the cheese is like super melty and like it's stringy? Like the best part. The best part. Well, the way they make it that way for the advertisements is by adding glue to the cheese and mixing it together so it's nice and stringy and sticky looking, so. Not the best part. Not the best part. <laughs> not, I'm not really into that. <laughs> Uh, sometimes to make a burger look juicier, this one you may know at home, maybe you actually are one of these weirdos, but they keep the burger totally raw inside mm. to make it look a little bit juicier, a little bit more supple, a little bit more just fulfilling than it probably is actually going to be. Get a little side of salmonella with your burger there. <laughs> Uh, what about this one? To give the nice layers in the advertisement, they'll often add like toothpicks in there so that when you bite down, it's a nice, <laughs> <laughs> nice extra crunch there. That feels like a death <laughs> trap. <laughs> I love it. Okay, well, cool. the point is, why, do we, why are we talking about burgers? I mean, it's a vegan and a vegetarian talking about burgers. It sounds, Doesn't really fit, it sounds a little crazy. But the point is, the burger in the ad, it looks really good. It looks really appetizing. Yeah. But it's not even edible. This is, the, this is the edible burger. The one in the ad isn't. It's not very mm. useful. And I, I want to just begin today by asking the question, does our faith sometimes look like that? Like, are there times in our lives where on the outside, our faith looks really good, really appealing, but inwardly we're crumbling? You see, for many of us, we live in a world where we've had safety nets of financial and job security or social media and being able to post highlight reels of our lives or even gathering in church where we can put on a Sunday best and our faith can look really good on the outside, but inwardly is crumbling. The question that I want us to spend today, this morning wrestling through and that Jesus really addresses in our text today is the question of, am I more obsessed with what my faith looks like or am I more concerned with what my faith actually is? And so as we begin this morning, if you've been with us over the last several months in all three of our churches, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, literally week by week walking with Jesus in a series we call Jesus Unwavering. And when we decided to do this series, I don't know that any of us really knew what this would mean for us or what we'd be walking through right now. But man, I can't think of a better thing to be talking through during this season where a lot of things have been stripped away for us and we're, faced to kind of, we're forced to kind of face the reality of what is the status of our faith right now. And so if, if you know where we're at right now, we're in Mark chapter 9. And Jesus really begins to address this question with his disciples. He begins to essentially ask them, are you more concerned with what your discipleship to me looks like or what it actually is? Because at this point in the story, there's a significant shift that happens in Jesus' ministry. 
all along up until now, he's been teaching crowds and doing miracles that impact thousands and thousands of people and massive healings that tons of people are seeing. But from this point on in the story, we start to see some words that start to, to pick up and start to kind of jump out. And the words are on the way. You see, Jesus' ministry at this point has become very focused on getting to Jerusalem and the work of the cross. And he needs his disciples to understand that. And so if you'll join me in Mark 9, verse 42, Jesus again asks this question of his disciples. Are you, are you more concerned with what your faith looks like or are you more concerned with what it actually is? And so in Mark chapter 9, verse 42, it says this, if anyone causes... One of these little ones, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he's saying, if anyone causes these new people in their faith, these vulnerable people in following me to stumble, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. <laughs> Jesus doesn't really mince words with his disciples. But keep in mind here, he's not talking to large crowds in this passage. He's talking to the people that are closest to him. And he uses a really familiar metaphor for them. This metaphor of drowning, which was a Roman form of capital punishment. And what Jesus is basically saying to his disciples is he's saying when all the pomp and circumstance is stripped away, when the, the big crowds and when everybody is watching is kind of taken away, who are you? What kind of person are you? What does your faith look like? And what Jesus says is it's essentially better for you to live on death row with all rights and all status and all uh, wealth and everything else stripped away than for you to lead people away from me. You see, Jesus' heart is for people. He's obsessed with people. It's why he came to do his ministry and live and die and, and, and be here among us. You see, Jesus cares about people who are vulnerable in their faith. He cares about people who are really far from him. He cares about people who have questions and doubts. He cares about people who are scared and living in the unknown. He cares about you and where you're at right now. And what he's saying in this text is he's saying, if you have been a follower of me, like if you are one of those who are closest to me, you better watch your stuff. You better keep an eye on what kind of example you're setting for other people. You need to keep an eye on, on how you're representing me. Are you, are you like the Big Mac advertisement where it looks really good on the outside or are you the real thing, the real deal? Because here's the thing. Jesus understood that for many people, the only picture that they would ever have of him was how his disciples and his followers and later the church would engage with people in the world. This stuff really matters to Jesus and he's really serious about it. And so, I want you to just hear this statement today, that, that as I've grown in my faith with Jesus, as he's taught me things, and I've had to go through hard stuff and suffering and challenges, one of the things that I've, I've learned or am learning is that I don't really care what my faith looks like as much anymore. I care about what it is. I care about what happens behind the scenes. I care about how I treat people when nobody else is looking. These are the things that Jesus is really kind of drawing out in this text here. And he's saying, is there, is there anything in any of your relationships that is getting in the way of people seeing me? You see, Jesus isn't looking for you to be an advertisement for him. He's looking for you to be evidence, an embodiment of who he is to the people in your life. So is there anything, any relationships that I have where there are stumbling blocks, there are things getting in the way of other people experiencing Jesus? You see, friends, right now we're in a, we're in a season, we're in a time where so many things have been stripped away from us. And we have an opportunity to focus on really who we are in Christ. So maybe over the last week or two, you've, you've been laid off. You've lost your job. Are the words that you are saying and posting about your employer, your boss, your fellow employees, 
Are they stumbling blocks to people meeting Jesus? Or are they leading the way for people to, to meet him? In your marriage, are the words you're using creating stumbling blocks for your spouse to meet with Jesus, to experience him and his love? Or are they standing in the way? In your relationships with your kids, this is a big one for me, are, are, is the way that you're treating with them and interacting with them creating stumbling blocks for them to experience Jesus or a path, a way for them to experience him? Guys, I don't care about what my faith looks like as much as I care about what it actually is. And I think there's a lot of opportunities right now for us to, if you're a Christ follower, live out your faith in really difficult ways. To live out your faith in ways that cost us something. To live out our faith in ways that uh, are sacrificial. You see, guys, Jesus goes on here and he doesn't just talk about He doesn't just talk about how we act towards other people, but he also says, you need to look at yourself. And you need to say, are there things in my life that are keeping me from Jesus? Not just other people from Jesus, but are there things in my life, things that are left unhealed, things that are left undealt with, junk that I've walked through for years and years and years that I've just left unattended to, undealt with. And Jesus says this, and (laughs) believe it or not, he gets even harsher with his disciples in this metaphor. In verse 43, he says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. (laughs) Just just get rid of it, right? He's not mincing words here. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell. Where the fire never goes out and your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Man, this is really intense stuff for a Sunday morning. And I get that. And I understand that. But what I think is really important for us to recognize is that where the world says be really harsh on other people and really kind to yourself, scripture actually flips that. And it says, be patient and forbearing and loving towards other people. But the stuff in your life, be ruthless about getting rid of anything in your life that gets in the way of you experiencing and loving Jesus and showing that love to other people. You see, Jesus uses this metaphor of amputation. And for most of us, amputation is really bad news. It's involuntary. In fact, right now in quarantine, it feels a lot like a metaphorical amputation. We've been cut off from a lot of our rhythms and a lot of our norms and a lot of the things that like we we cling to. Even things as simple as toilet paper. We have been amputated from access to toilet paper. Now, if you're if you're a Christ follower that is hoarding toilet paper right now, I will social distance punch you in the face for that in Jesus name. But the point is, the point is that. As as we are engaging in this season where it feels like so many things are are cut off from our lives, friends, quarantine is an involuntary amputation, but discipleship following Jesus is constantly looking for opportunities in our life to say, this doesn't have a place in my life. Like this is keeping me from Jesus. And so I want to ask a question, and John and I are going to answer this question as well, but this is kind of a a, a bold question, and I understand that. And and I need you to hear my heart that I don't ask this from a pastor's perspective who's just removed from everything that we're walking through. I ask this as a fellow human being, a Christ follower, who's walking through a lot of the same struggles and questions right now. And the question is this, might God be using this season This season of involuntary amputation or or stripping away or cutting off of things in your life to teach you how to voluntarily strip away things in your life. To teach you how to identify things in your life that have no place there. To reorient habits and priorities and perspectives. You see, you may not like what's happening around you. I might not like what's happening to me in this season right now. But that doesn't mean that God can't do something and cultivate something beautiful inside of us that nobody else sees until the fruit of it comes out. And so, John, for you, if you were to guess, you know, what what God's teaching you in this season right now, teaching you as far as 
you know, cutting things off and, and getting rid of things in your life so that your faith can not just look the part and look good, but actually like be like Jesus? What, what would you say that is for you? Yeah. Um, as the aroma of the Big Mac. I know you can like smell my it nostrils. Right <laughs> um, one of the things for me, and I shared this with you earlier in this week, is I think Jesus has been slowly over time, and this is not a brand new work he's doing necessarily, mm -hmm. but over time he separated my discipleship with him, my life with him, from my leadership for him, mm -hmm. the things I do for him, the positions I hold. And I think a lot of people go through that journey, but I think there's an opportunity in this season to go through it even more. And mm -hmm. I think Jesus has just reminded me because he's so good and kind and he's patient with me that that's the journey he wants me to be on too. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lindsay and I have still had fears. Yeah. Um, we sat in our bed at night and just thought about what's the worst case scenario. I mean, I won't lie. That's obviously, mm -hmm. we we're afraid. We don't know what necessarily is happening. Um, but we both have been able, I think, to trust God even more because it's so unknown and it's mm -hmm. so unclear. And I think every morning just starting my day knowing that I can put that day in Jesus' hands mm -hmm. has been a really eye-opening thing for me. It's been a voluntary thing yeah. to change some of those habits so I can experience that for myself. Yeah. What about for you? And I think for me, you know, I those same feelings of just kind of anxiety and stuff rising up and even like... Um, you know, when <laughs> working from home is an adjustment with kids. And uh, I think uh, what God is teaching me is just to slow down, to like find my rest and my rhythms and the quiet places with him. Um, you know, when anxiety starts to creep up, I find myself just wanting, and this sounds so like pastor-ish pastor and cliche to say, uh, but it's so true. Just going back to that quiet place with him and just saying, God, this is what is in me. This is what is hurting right now. This is what is fearful. This is what is scared. God, will you carry that for me? Mm -hmm. Like, I can't carry that burden on my own. Will you carry that for me? And I think what he's teaching me is like, you know, reasons to be scared and anxious are never going to go away in this world. They're just not. Right. Sometimes, you know, they're more pressing. Sometimes they're more distant. But the thing that he's teaching me is just to constantly return to him in that secret, quiet place. Wow. That's awesome. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting for us as <laughs> we've just got more time on our hands at home is that <laughs> a couple months ago, Lindsay and I bought a place, which you know and you've seen. Um, and it's a awesome mid-century house in an awesome neighborhood. And at the same time, it has a lot of work left to do. And one of the biggest projects we tried to knock out right away was redoing all of our kitchen, dining, kind of some <laughs> of our living spaces with brand new flooring which was really exciting at first. Mm -hmm. And so we labored over that. We cried over it. We <laughs> fought over it. We were trying to figure out what is the right floor to pick for this house. <laughs> and uh, it just had wood everywhere. We we're trying to match it. It was- You uh, came to our house to look yeah, at wood exactly, at one point. Exactly, we did, we did. Uh, we needed a lot of help. So <laughs> we eventually found the floor. And a couple weeks ago with a lot of our Center Church awesome people helped us. Uh, we finally got it laid out. It looked great. We were taking <laughs> selfies on social media with it. It was awesome. We were really excited about it. Until uh, about a week ago, we were walking around the kitchen. Dinner was wrapping up, mm -hmm. and we heard, <laughs> and I was like, man, that sounds a lot like water. <laughs> and Lindsay stepped on a couple boards and sure enough, water started to come out of the middle oh, of our kitchen floor, which by the way, if you're not a homeowner yet, that's not supposed to happen, okay? <laughs> that is not where water belongs. So we tried to dry it out with some fans overnight, nothing happened, still water. We tried more fans overnight, still had some water. Finally, we just looked at each other and said, we're gonna have to take this floor out. It was about 500 square feet of floor. We had just busted our rear ends to get totally done <laughs> in order to have some people over. And so slowly but surely, the day, next day, I was in that room just tearing up the floor. There's water everywhere. It smelled bad. Some boards were ruined. Found out a water line had leaked through the bottom of our <laughs> kitchen floor and just flooded our entire uh, dining and living areas. It was really, really bad. Um, <laughs> But I thought about that as we were getting ready for this passage, and immediately what came to my mind was that's kind of what Jesus is talking about here. 
he's talking about what's beneath the surface. When the pressure is on, I mean, our floor looked great. I mean, the, the, it matched, it was beautiful, it was modern, it was so fresh in the room. Everything felt cleaner immediately. Uh, but what happened was there was a problem underneath the surface and things started to go really, really wrong. And now that I'm slowly putting the floor back together and drying out our dining room and our kitchen, what I think is true is that in that moment, I didn't care what my floor looked like. I cared about what it was. I wanted it to be a dry floor. I wanted it to be uh, not wet and soaked and gross and boards warping and tongue and groove disintegrating. <laughs> like I did not want that stuff. And I think about my own spiritual life and just what you were talking about. And I think for many of us, that is the opportunity we have in this season. We have an opportunity to allow Jesus to do a deeper work in our own discipleship to him. We have the opportunity to let Jesus take up some floorboards, to let him rearrange some things, to get under the hood of our lines, of our lives. See, there was a leak in the water line that had to be resolved. There was flooring that had to be dried out. We had to buy new flooring in order to replace boards that were warped. But I don't really care about just what it looks like because that whole week in between putting the floors down and finding the leak, they looked great. They were incredible. But I, just like Jesus, I, that's the same way I want to view my faith. I don't care about what my faith looks like. I care about what it is. I care about the raw product. And that's why Jesus is so intent, even as Brad read, and we're going to keep reading, in verse 48, here's what Jesus quotes from Isaiah 66. He says, it's better with, for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone, he's including everyone in that, everyone will be salted with fire. Wow. I mean, Jesus is issuing a strong warning to his disciples to not lead other people astray by their own lives, to live real, to be pure and authentic disciples of Jesus, to live out his teachings, to do what he did, to follow him to the places that he would go. Here's what's hard, is that a couple weeks ago as the lockdown started in our state, as kids started coming home with like weeks worth of homework now because there was no chance there was going to be even a real, real semester left, as your job probably shifted overnight, as restaurants shut down, as your favorite places to go after work closed up, when the sporting events were canceled, when the flights to Florida no longer meant anything because you just couldn't go. Some of you didn't hightail it to Meyer to get milk and bread and eggs. Some of you hightailed it to the nearest liquor store to escape. Some of you hightailed it to the website, which you immediately delete from your search history. Some of you hightailed it to places that maybe your faith wasn't comfortable going. And I don't care about what my faith looks like. I don't care about what your faith looks like. I care, and Jesus deeply cares about what it is, because see friends, this crisis is continuing. It's not over. And what happens when someone in your family gets COVID-19? What happens when someone in our church gets COVID-19? What happens when your best friend, your employer, your roommate, your sister gets COVID-19? What, what will our response be? And our choice to ground our faith and to root our discipleship in Jesus in a brand new, fresh, surrendered way today will make all of the difference to how we answer that question. C.S. Lewis, an author and theologian who I love and respect, says this, how you actually respond to an interruption is how you actually are. How you respond to an interruption is the real you. It's your identity. When it's under pressure and under crisis, you find out what you're really like. And this virus, friends, is a massive interruption. Everything has changed. Now, a lot more people are walking their dogs outside. <laughs> but other than that, everything else is pretty much changed. And, but here's what, the, here's what I want you to hear. And this is from my heart. I believe that this crisis can purify your faith. I believe that on the other side of this, you can look back five years later and say, I'm so glad, I'm so glad 
that I allow God to move in my life during that season. I allowed my rhythms of scripture and prayer and fasting and silence and worship and community and relationships to go even deeper in this time. I didn't escape. I engaged Jesus in the midst of it. Because right now in this season, you're probably coming to grips with how good of a parent you actually are. You're probably coming to grips with how good of a spouse you actually are. And there's a good chance you're coming to grips with how devoted to Jesus you really are. Because all of those usual safety nets have fallen away. There's no sporting event to go to. There's no bar to run to. There's no work to have a conversation about or to talk about the latest news or to find solace and, and peace in another relationship outside of you. Like all of that stuff is gone. The safety nets have fallen away. And right now, Jesus is inviting you to place your faith in Him again, to believe in Him again, to surrender to Him again. He, he doesn't really even care necessarily in this season about what your faith looks like or what it looked like 10 years ago or what it looked like 10 weeks ago or 10 days ago. He cares about what it is right now, and He wants to do a deeper work in you today. I was talking with Brad, one of my friends, his name is Charlie. And Charlie reminds me of the end of this passage, because at the end of this passage, Jesus says, salt's good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Which, sitting in front of a Big Mac, makes a lot of sense. And no, Jesus was not a sodium freak here, uh, but I think Jesus <laughs> is saying something about flavor and preservative. Now, I, I love to watch cooking shows. I'm not sure why, because I'm a terrible cook. I really haven't learned that much, unfortunately. <laughs> but on YouTube, there's a couple of chefs I like to watch. And one of the things they say is season at every stage. Season at every stage. It brings out more of the flavor in the food. Well, my friend Charlie reminds me of how Jesus ends this when he's talking about salt and being at peace and being in good relationship with one another. Uh, Charlie is an older guy in our church who's got a history of heart issues. And so by all accounts for COVID-19, Charlie is in a vulnerable population. And I know you've got people at New Life mm -hmm. who fall into that boat. And if you're watching here at Frontline, you do as well. But Charlie did something that was really remarkable. Uh, Monday, he kind of gathered a bunch of people, printed out maps, found addresses, um, contacted the principal of a school that we sponsor through Hand to Hand. Frontline, you sponsor students through hand-to-hand -hand at Northview and some other uh, local schools. I know New, uh, New Life does in Wayland. We mm -hmm. do at a school called Oreo Park. And there was 174 meals that needed to be delivered, three weeks worth of meals that need to be delivered to kids who otherwise would not have food. Mm -hmm. And Charlie's kind of been the point person for us at our church. And he said, I can't physically go deliver these but I'm going to make sure it happens. Mm -hmm. And it got really freaky because Governor Whitmer was like, hey, at midnight, stay at home, <laughs> basically. And we were supposed to do this at 5 o'clock that day. And so Charlie said, we can make this happen. We can mm -hmm. do it. Pulled people together. And uh, my wife and I got to be a part of it with a bunch of people from our church, just dropping these bags off to families who, without the, the structure of school, likely mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to feed their kids, which is a reality and a crisis. And what I think was so remarkable is Charlie, who's one of the most vulnerable populations, stepped up, lived out what Jesus is saying right here, and served one of the most vulnerable mm. populations. Mm. Kids who maybe wouldn't have food. Mm. And kids who during this crisis are directly affected. And we could do something about it as the church. And so for me, if you ask me, do I care about what Charlie's faith looked like a month ago? Not really. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I care about what it looked like on Monday night when he lived out his faith and mm -hmm. became what Jesus was talking about, bringing out what Eugene Peterson says in the message, the God flavors of this mm -hmm. world. And for me, that was just a, a moment to see it's more about what your faith is really about in this, this season, in this crisis, mm -hmm. than what it looked like a couple weeks ago. Man, I... Uh... I think we've just seen beautiful story after beautiful story from all yeah. three churches in this season of people that, um, that are giving out of the little that they have, no matter what that looks like. And uh, man, I think that's a picture of, of the gospel. And you know, you think about Jesus and when it came to barriers and things that got in the way of us being able to experience the love of God, that was the entire mission of Jesus was to come 
to live a perfect life and to remove every single barrier, every single distorted lens, every single obstacle that we had to experience in the Father's love. Right. Like this message is not just a do better and try harder. This message is like in this season of, of being purified and um, really an opportunity to take stock of your own life. Where are the areas of your life that, that you need to surrender? That you need to say, God, I've been holding on to this for too long. God, will you carry this for me? I love how Hebrews talks about the work that Jesus did and how literally Jesus' body was the veil that was torn in the temple for your sake. He was broken for you. He went through this. He went through this process of metaphorical amputation and stripping things away so that we could have clear access to the Father's love. And then that, like confessing that over and over, even two weeks out from Easter right now, I mean, that should do something in our hearts. Yeah. That should do something that, that makes us more like Jesus as we surrender and confess the things in our lives, uh, especially in this season right now where things are being taken away and things feel out of our control, that, that God, you are still here, you are still working, and you are still deeply, deeply in love with us. Yeah. Um, and so we just want to end today with an invitation for you to, to just look at your own life and, mm -hmm. and basically say, what is it for you? Like what areas of your life do things look good on the outside, but God really wants to do a work in this season and cultivate and do beautiful things to really transform you into the likeness of, of who Jesus is. And so what is that for you? I think uh, I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit is speaking to that to each yeah. person right now. And I know, uh, you know, he's really challenging this in me right now. And, and I know with you too, John, in our mm -hmm. conversations this week. And so... I would love to just close us with prayer and then we're gonna, we're gonna go into worship yeah. again. God, we are, uh, we're so grateful to you. And God, I know that there's a lot of people in our uh, communities right now, whether it's in Grand Rapids or Byron Center or Wayland, God, that are just really uh, just hurting right now, uh, that are struggling for answers that aren't sure where their next meal is going to come from or their next mortgage payment is going to come from god we uh we just as the church want to say that we believe you are present in that that you are invested and god that you want to do something deeply beautiful inside of each and every one of us that you want to cultivate something in us during this season where the things that distract us from who you are and from your love are stripped away, are literally amputated, like Jesus says in Mark here, where we can experience and see you for who you truly are and how much you deeply love us. And so God, give us eyes to see that in this season. So Jesus, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.